All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us, both in person and online. My name is Gina Kim. I'm the faculty director in the arts at the Radcliffe Institute and the George P. Bickford Professor of Indian and South Asian Art and Professor of South Asian Studies in the Faculty of Arts and Science at Harvard. Uh, so welcome to the panel, this panel discussion for the exhibition, Water Stories. Before proceeding, I'd like to start by thanking the members of the Radcliffe Institute Me uh, Leadership Society and our annual do donors who are watching. And your generosity really keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. And we also wish to gratefully recognize the Johnson Klukundis Family Endowment Fund for the Arts, which is supporting the Water Stories exhibition. I would also like to thank the Harvard Art Museum and the Peabody Essex Museum for generously lending, uh, loaning their precious objects to the exhibition. I'd like to mention uh, that Harvard Art Museums also have a th thematic display of water stories in their permanent galleries. So for those of you who can visit our exhibition, uh, you should definitely check out their galleries as well. <clears throat> the exhibition has a companion website where you can read about the whole works in the exhibition and uh, find curated resources on climate crisis and also share your own water stories. And so for this website, special mention must be made to acknowledge the generous support from the Arts and Humanities Dean's Office and Arts and Humanities Research Computing Team for making this website possible. So the idea for the Water Stories exhibition came about while discussing the Climate Change Initiative at Radcliffe, which is a, spe a special strategic focus area at the Radcliffe Institute, which aims to explore the impacts of the climate crisis through an interdisciplinary lens and to address issues of climate justice, particularly the disproportionate effects on marginally com marginalized communities locally and globally. So as an art historian, working on South Asian art, my familiarities with many objects, sites, and people of the Indian subcontinent that are disproportionately affected by the impact of climate change meant that the discussion of climate change rang quite true, uh, climate justice, justice rang quite true, directly related to addressing the long legacy of imperialism and colonialism and global imbalances. I was particularly interested in exploring the potential of art in cultivating climate empathy. Empathy, the human quality that allows people to understand other beings, especially of dire circ climate circumstances of others beyond the abstract intellectual level. <clears throat> this is why the title of the exhi exhibition is Water Stories, to invoke the transformative power of stories in cultivating empathy. And this is why we have an accompanying exhibition website I was explaining earlier that asks everyone to share their own water stories for collective storytelling. The aim is to shift the frame of reference beyond one's own and recalibrate our relationship with nature from an extensive economy to its, from an extractive economy to one of respect and compassion. I believe stories of na nature-human relationships from the global south and indigenous communities everywhere will be particularly important in this process. So today's program will proceed as follows. During the first hour, we'll hear from the three contemporary artists featured in the exhibition, followed by a discussions, discussion amongst the panelists and an audience Q&A. And after a short break, it's a two hour, like a little over two hour program, we'll resume our second panel for which we have two scholars of Indian religions and anthropology to talk about river religion and climate crisis with one of the artists as discussant, again followed by an audience Q&A. And since we have a hybrid program, I'd like to mention that we uh, use a special system to handle the q and It's called Slido. And so audience members are welcome to submit questions at any point uh, in time throughout the program. And our speakers will get to as many as they can. Whether you are here with us in person or watching online, you can submit question using the Slido link that is provided on the scene behind me or posted in the chat feature of the Zoom webinar. <clears throat> So let me introduce the panelists for, of the first session. Every, and I'm gonna introduce all of them at once and then we'll hear from them and then we'll um, sort of start the discussion, okay? And I'm so excited that we have all three artists here. So Evelyn, Evelyn Ritz, who will speak first, is a visual artist that works in painting, drawing, photography, and site responsive installations, focusing particularly on water bodies of all scale. Riz received her MFA from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at 
Tufts University and is currently professor at Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Abdul Pala is a conceptual artist working on environmental urgencies, particularly the everyday relationship between the Yamuna and her urban communities. Pala earned his BFA from Delhi University and his MFA from the School of Art of Northern Illinois University. He is currently professor and head of the Department of Art, Media, and Performance at Shiv Nadar <coughs> University, Delhi, India. And Bala is also the Lakshmi Mittal Family South Asia Institute's Distinguished Climate Artist in Residence this month. And finally, we will end with Alia Farid, who is a filmmaker, sculptor, whose practice centers lesser known histories that are deliberately erased, like the ecological devast devastation of southern Iraq and the forced displacement of its people. Farid holds a BA from uh, La Escuela de Artes Pláticas de Puerto Rico and MS in Visual Studies from the Visual Arts Program at MIT, and also MA in Museum Studies and Critical Theory from the Independent Studies Program at MACBA Barcelona. She's this year's uh, David Roberta Rogge Fellow at Radcliffe. So uh, please welcome Evelyn Riz to the podium. Thank you so much. I want to start by thanking you, Gina, for inviting me to be part of this exhibition. I'm honored to be here with you all today. Um, I also want to thank the Radcliffe team, Meg Ratzel and Joe Zane. Today, I'm going to share a few examples of my work. Um, I'll share the three works I've created specifically for the exhibition, and I'll also share, situate them within a few examples of previous projects. My process begins from studying, from documenting, from walking, from drawing from bodies of water across the Americas, from here in the Boston area where I'm based, to Miami where I was raised, to Cuba and Colombia where my parents were born. For over a decade, my practice has centered on water, its interconnection, and our embodied relationships to it. During the pandemic, while still in quarantine, I began to look through my photos and discovered over 10 years of surface water that I had collected. I started to rip these apart and put them back together in a kind of quilting, a kind of patchwork, bringing together different times and different locations. From this body of water, open oceans, I created Outflux, a new site responsive installation for the Water Stories exhibition. I imagined different rivers ocean, and the oceans they enter into coming together as a single connected body of work, yet each image retains its own individual identity. The local ecologies are reflected in the water surface from different colors, different textures, and currents moving in all different directions. As I was making the piece, I was thinking a lot about heavy rainfall and flooding, especially here in the US Northeast, at the same time as other regions experience extreme drought. I imagine the installation as the outdoor entering the indoor, imagining the way a leak might enter a building, small, maybe unnoticeable at first, but accumulating over time, pouring down into the gallery space, into the built environment, and pooling into the gallery space as it makes its way closer to the viewer. In this detail, I really want to emphasize part of the process of creasing, ripping, and folding. This process interrupts expectations of where the water flows and how it moves. I think a lot about human impacts and shifting climate and the way they disrupt our own expectations of daily life, our own daily life, and our reliance on water. As the installation moves to the gallery floor, it accumulates. The folding starts to accumulate. It's layered, hiding some parts of the water. The folding is also a form of delineation, of creating marked borders and boundaries that the water does not adhere to. The water circulates, is in constant living fluid motion, and doesn't adhere to those sharp divides. Another piece in the exhibition that I made for this um, Water Stories exhibition is Folded Waters. It also works with processes of ripping, of creasing, of folding. It's a kind of puzzling, a trying to make sense of something that can't ever be fully put back together. The, image, the, the imagery also starts with my photos of surface water. They're repeated at multiple scales, multiple times. 
It goes through many iterations in the making, from a photograph to a print. The piece starts with the photograph, then goes to a print, a three-dimensional sculpted form, back to photographs, and the final image, the final iteration, is a drawing that records these iterations. I think of those a lot like generational storytelling. Parts of the story are lost and made blurry. Other parts are sharpened and brought into focus, but the core of the story remains the same. My work shifts a lot back and forth between different scales and different perspectives as a way to really process and make sense of micro and macro scales. From projects like this one that examine the life cycles of ocean debris, magnifying them into larger than life portraits, to drawings like this one, imagining future archeologists examining remnants of our daily lives, to installations that map local rivers, industrial histories, sources of drinking water, and impacted communities, to participatory projects that bring visibility to ocean acidification using pH test paper, to thinking of macro geologic timescales in drawings that use found rope to trace currents through global oceanic conveyor belts, estimated to take a body of water a thousand years to cycle the globe. In preparing for this exhibition, I had the opportunity to visit the Harvard Art Museum with Gina and study the close attention to details in these paintings from Jai Kassan's 18th century paintings. In these paintings, you could see a range of scales and perspectives that required really close observation. We looked at the paintings through magnifying glasses, which reminded me a lot of my own practice of drawing through a jeweler's glasses, through the jeweler's lens. I was particularly drawn to this image on the left, um, Jai Kassan's painting depicting the origin of the Ganga River, half Shiva, half Parvati form of Shiva, dancing with Ganga, flowing from the top knot. It's from a Ragamala series, A Garland of Melodies. Looking closely at the details, the reverence for water is evident, both in the story it depicts, but also in the way the painting has been crafted. In the detail on the left, a small emerald-colored iridescent beetle shell draws our attention to the top knot of the conjoined bodies of Shiva and Parvati. It draws our attention to the descent and the flow of water. In the detail on the right, the description of the flow of water, the movement of water, is made with precision, with care, with intention in every single line. I was drawn not only towards this orientation to detail, the craft and care in making, but also to the representation of water as sacred. Thinking of these Ragamala paintings, I was really inspired by Jack Kazan's care for and about through the process of making. This image is a, a drawing in the water created specifically for the Water Stories exhibition called Unraveling. It's made of found rope. This is a material I find on nearly every coast I have visited and studied. There are fragments of rope that I splice together in order to join them and make a stronger join with another they are opened up, taken apart, and put back together. I see these ropes as in a state of friction. They're both coming together, but also in a state of falling apart. This drawing detail, I want, in this drawing detail, I really wanted to highlight the way my work, and my drawings in particular, are really immersed in thinking about line, in coastline, in horizon line, in the drawn line, and in questions of the line of what our eyes have the capacity to see beyond the horizon line, below the water's surface. My detail-oriented process is a kind of quiet resistance to consumer cycles, from extraction to mass production, to quick consumption and disposability that so often starts and ends in the water. My work attempts to disrupt perceptions of the ocean and fresh water as if they were endless, inexhaustible resources. Through my work, I hope to engage with and represent water stories that are interconnected with reverence and with care. Thank you so much. It's now my pleasure to call Atul Bala to share his work.
Good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, I thank, I thank uh, the Harvard Radcliffe Center for, and the Luxury Metal Institute <coughs> for inviting me here and hosting me here. I also thank Gina, Meg, Megan, Toby, and a lot of other people who made this possible and to, for me to talk here and to be here. Thank you everyone. And everyone else who's uh, here every <coughs> this morning, thank you all for coming. Uh, you always step into the same river. This work uh, came out of uh, my idiotic whim of actually getting a boat made on the Yamuna. The Yamuna, as you would know, is one of, not one of anymore, is the most polluted river in the world. And the environs around Delhi are <coughs> 39 of the 50 most polluted cities in the world. 39 of them are in India. So the wake, this work came out and it was called the wake. And <coughs> a, a boat hangs <coughs> midway between where it should be and where it might go, suspended in midair a moment before it may touch the water or not. It could also be a moment before the boat ends its journey and is liberated from its function delivered, a moment of dilemma, a wooden boat midair awaiting its release, but which way? What happens when the river touches the city? What, but what, <clears throat> but does the city even want to touch its river? The wake, the wake to the uh, river Yamuna, the boat which sprang out of my idiotic whim to get a boat made in Delhi and the exploration, explorative journey resulting in an expansive ethnographic exploration of the traditional boat making techniques of the upper river, upper Ganga basin staging a singular personal experience, the shared key characteristics of which is that it may be an, has an immediate and instinctive interaction with the landscape to which water is central. Researched and executed between 2012 and 13 for the Heritage Transport Museum, a private public partner, partnership just outside of Delhi. The installation at the museum is called the wake, a wake or aftermath of a death, a vigil held along with the body of someone who has died, sometimes accompanied by ritual observances. This has me uh, collaborating uh, with the boat makers of the upper river Ganges Basin from Dhani, which is just north of Gorakhpur in the state of Uttar Pradesh, in just northern <coughs> India. And the three collaborators, uh, me, <coughs> Subhash, Ram Bhuvan and Mahamaji, we all collaborated in making the boat. And as you can see, the boat, the final boat had two rudders each on each end. And obviously, this was an intervention that I insisted on when they were making the boat. And they were aghast that, OK, why do you want to have a, bag, a boat with two backsides? Right? Uh, I, I, say, I said, please make the provision, and then we can kind of I'll get to know what will happen. So they made the provision. We had a boat with two backs, uh, a boat with two rudders on each end. And when we finally took the boat to, uh, to the Yamuna to put it to water, and then they realized that uh, the river is not flowing because this was at the Wazirabad barrage where they block all water, and there is no river flow on the Yamuna River. So all of that <coughs> water that is, uh, accumulates there is only just moves in circles, and so would the boat as well. So you know, so that, and then they understood. Okay, yeah, you know, they said in Hindi, "Jamuna ji to nahi chal rahe," which means the river is not moving. They understood. So it was a wonderful collaboration I had with my <coughs> with these traditional boat makers from the upper river Ganges basin. Also, the thing was that I wanted to collaborate, get this boat made which was typical of the upper river Ganges Basin because the Kerala boats, the Calcutta boats, the Banaras boats are all in the public imagination. And this particular Pattaya now, which is the boat with made with planks, is not 
within the public imagination. So that was part of the work. Then it kind of materialized as a <coughs> install, not materialized, it was the intention of putting it at the museum. And it, the canopy came up later and still installed at the Heritage Transport Museum outside of Delhi. This is another boat which, uh, which is, uh, comes from a work called <coughs> On Dwapayana. This is currently and is still being exhibited at the Howard Art Museums on the fourth floor. If you have time, please go and see it. On the Vapayana, uh, looking for lost water. Uh, in Sanskrit, the Vapayana literally means that which is surrounded by water. Looking for lost water in Delhi, I perform at, uh, at locations named after or for water within my home city. Old wells, step wells, some other bodies like old <coughs> water bodies that have been covered over to make way for roads or to, for ease of traffic. Some remain only within the public imagination of the older generation and referring to water bodies lost to time or to greed. The abstracted silhouette body, perhaps a dehumanizing shape and at other times with a head in supplication may be a metaphor for defeat, submission, confessing. The head so bowed down that it's almost admitting guilt. And this is uh, a few other images of uh, this is the uh, well, the chap, the thatched well in Karolbag. This is at the Kari Bauli in Old Delhi. This is the uh, Janta Piao. Piao means the water spigots, which are free in Old Delhi. And the, it is called Panchkunya Road, which means the road with eight wells. We don't know where the eight wells went. This is me sitting there. And this is something that came up from, from the Vaina object that I found on my <coughs> research along the river, exhibited at the gallery in Delhi. What will be my defeat is another work, uh, actually, that came up with inspiration from the Mahabharata in which the Indian epic in which the Pandavas, the five kings, are in exile and they reach a body of water and each one wants to drink. The younger princes, being younger princes, there's a voice that comes from the body of water says, before you drink, answer my questions. And the younger princes, being younger princes, they don't heed the voice, they drink and they die. The eldest prince, Yudhishthira, says, examine me. Why should he say, what does it mean to be examined by a body of water? So these questions, uh, I take the questions from Peter Brook's Mahabharat. There are some 12 to 15 questions there. And the original Mahabharata, I think, has 54 questions, which kind of indicate. Uh, and I reformulated them for this project, which was the Yamuna and Elbe project, Hamburg, Delhi, two rivers, two cities. And each one kind of reformulating the questions, which were <laughs> some of the questions that were uh, which the water body asks the would-be king, uh, what is swifter than the wind? He says, thought. What can cover the earth? He says, darkness. <coughs> uh, give me an example of space. He says, my two hands is one. Give me an example of desire. And give me an example of poison. He says, desire. Give me an example of defeat. He says, victory. So I reformulated those questions as if the rivers, both Yamuna and the Elbe, would ask them today. What is my space? What is my madness? Uh, and <clears throat> what will be my defeat? It is af as if the river would be asking this question. I am sure rivers all over the world, we, one can kind of take this, these mythological questions and apply them to river anywhere across the world today. <clears throat> and then this manifested itself as direct cast that I had enlarged in paper mache and recycled wood, which is the, the text is in Hindi, the local language. And then I'm just going to move on to another work, which is called Vaitarni, supported by the Bhavadaji Lard Museum in Mumbai. Vaitarni or Vaitarna is mythically, the, mythically the Vaitarna river does not contain water. It is a river full of blood, pus with heaps of rotting bones, flesh, on it and banks of mud, mucus pass, seething with smoke, fumes, decay and misery, sifting carrion, worms, maggots, insects, scavenging birds and animals crowd its bank. It is impossible to cr cross this river to enter heaven. This is the river that mythically you would 
you will have to cross before either to be admitted to heaven or to hell. This is one of the Indian myths or the Hindu myths, as you say. And you, you, fall, you will fall into it with no rescuer. The hundreds of whirlpools in the river will make you, make you, will take you further to the lowest depths to rise again in filth of your own creation. We are all in Vedarna and there is no other bank. And I would like to read this. Uh, this is from the Gate Derangement by Amitabh Ghosh. This is referring to Mumbai and a lot of other cities which are on the, almost on the sea, Boston included, New York included, and, right? And at, at this point, waves would come pouring into South Mumbai, both of, from both of its sea-facing shorelines. It's not inconceivable to have two fronts of the storm surge to meet and merge. In this case, the hills and promontories of South Mumbai would once again become islands, which is the original seven islands. I just go through the images quickly. I think I'm on the end of my time allotted. Yeah, yeah. And this uh, became a work called for in Chennai, which is also on the edge working with fishermen there. If the rubber runs in me, then where is the sea? Thank you. My name's Alia. Thank you so much for um, being here today. And uh, to Gina and Meg and Joe and Becky for putting together this wonderful exhibition. Um, I'm going to talk about a group of work that I've been developing um, since about 2014, but um, which I first exhibited in 2019 at Porticus. And sort of, so you know, in my practice, I, I develop works um, like there are several strands of works that I'm developing in my studio, and um, the materials that I choose to work with sort of depend on, I think, what best represents an idea. But I mostly work in film and sculpture, and here at the Radcliffe, I'm developing an artist book that's very closely connected to the work I'll be sharing today. Um, this image here is of a, is of a used-to-be landscape um, in the south of Iraq, not far away from where I live in Kuwait. And the picture I found at the Aga Khan Documentation Center at MIT is a photo that was taken by um, the father of a well-known architect named Rifa Chadarchi. Um, and this image is of a community in the Abul Hasib uh, date palm forest in the south of Iraq. Um, and, and you'll see sort of how it connects to, to, to my work. Uh, this article here is in a used to be cultural magazine in Kuwait. Um, around the time when oil was discovered. And Kuwait is a country, a very small country, in the northern, northeastern uh, corner of the Arabian Peninsula. And um, that sort of developed very quickly after the discovery of oil. It went from being a mud city to a modern city in something like 20 years. And um, with the advent of oil, there are all these questions around modernity. Um, and in this article, or in this magazine article, the question of like where and how to source water is being asked kind of openly. Kuwait, historically, uh, it used to get its fresh drinking water from the south of Iraq at the uh, the Arab River, which is a very short river that comes together after sort of where the, the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers um, form the marshes, and then again the Shatul Arab River. Uh, so historically, Kuwait would send dow boats to bring back water and um, and distribute the water uh, to the small forted city that only at that time had like 10,000 inhabitants. And then after oil, everything sort of developed very quickly. And um, in thinking about these developments, um, I created this, these sculptures that I first exhibited. And so there are two sets of, of these sculptures that I first presented in 2019 in Porticus. And this set of water vessels I presented at the Kunsthal in Basel in Switzerland. But these vessels actually originate from a sort of long tradition of offering water to um, passers-by in the desert, people traveling through the desert, no? And um, yeah, the tradition is called Sabil, and historically it was a very modest offering of water that people would leave in front of their houses or in front of their businesses, and after the discovery of oil, they kind of went from, yeah, being this water that was sourced from the shut to these um, 
larger than life water vessels and drinking fountains that I became interested in because of how they kind of spoke about how could the past reappears in the present, you know? So I'm interested in, in these vessels and um, the provenance of some of the forms. For the Kunsthalle Basel exhibition, I should clarify, for the, for the um, Porticus exhibition, I worked with um, water vessel fabricators in Kuwait, and I called, like I picked from a catalog all the vessels that kind of alluded to water, they're different forms, everyday objects that kind of, yeah, it could be like um, a tennis ball or um, a lantern, but for the ex first exhibition of this work, I chose all the shapes related to water, and then for my second exhibition, I began collaborating with the fabricators on designing other vessels that speak to the kind of cultural and trade networks of the region. So the first vessel in this series is a lotta, and it's a reoccurring form in Gina's show. Um, the second vessel is a vessel that my grandmother gave me um, after she finished doing her pilgrimage to, um, to Mecca. And I was really interested in this shape because of how it's kind of, it's intersectional quality, you know, how it, how it speaks as a kind of uh, religious tourism and um, like petrol uh, industry in, in Saudi Arabia. And then the third vessel is a vessel that's more commonly seen in the Levant, so in, um, in like Syria and Lebanon. And then the fourth vessel is like a, is one that's in both series. And I think for people who are less familiar with the other silhouettes away into the project, it's the ubiquitous PET water bottle. And then the last form is a jug that I sort of grew up seeing translated into plastic, but is a form that originates in the south of Iraq and is typically seen in, uh, in brass or in ceramics. Um, so here are some more images of the installation. You'll see that the vessels have this back door and I deliberately kept the door and the mouth of the vessels because I'm interested in their kind of like dual um, function of being like a vessel but also a drinking fountain that's connected to the kind of water distribution in network in Kuwait which is currently supplied by desalination water plants, you know, rather than uh, natural water that came from the Shatel Arab River. Um, this uh, installation was exhibited also in Kunsthalle Basel in the next room. Um, and this work is, is more closely connected to, well, they're all sort of uh, interconnected, but this is a tapestry made of um, pipe slings. And um, yeah, the, the, the way that I see this work is connected to like the destruction of the of the Iraqi marshes. So where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers come together, there are three interconnected wetland lakes, Khod al-Hummar, uh, Hueza, and Sugishu. And um, since uh, the 1930s, the, the marshland residents have experienced a kind of draining, first by the government with the intention of um, sedentarizing the population. And then later, I mean, there have been several episodes of that. and then. In the late 1980s, the Iraqi marshes became the battlefield for the Iran-Iraq war, and that's when it experienced its most um, severe draining. And then recently, there have been efforts to reflood the marshes, but um, a lot of the way that it's being done is kind of problematic in this, in the sense that, like, yeah, there's below the subsoil of the Iraqi marshes is one of the biggest oil reserves in the world, so there's a lot of issues around how uh, that reflooding is happening. Um, and uh, yeah, for those of you who, who understand like the wetland ecosystems, it's not like you can, um, yeah, the, the canals are being carved and so it's sort of like the wetlands are being urbanized in a way. Um, but this, this I sort of, uh, and not explicitly with the films, but this is something that I sort of address with the films that I make, you know? This installation at the Whitney Biennial, I think last year in 2022, yeah, <laughs> is, a, is a representation of the, the first image I shared of the, the no longer day palm forest. And like the water vessels, I'm interested in, in how the past kind of appears in the, in the new urban landscape, right? And how these day, day palm, uh, how the day palm forest is represented in, in these kind of low grade stand-ins for this used to be a place. Um, I'm going to share a, 
a snippet of the film. So the film on the, in the exhibition is um, part of this film project that I've been developing for a while now, and, and um, I'll show you the first film um, I shot. So, um, sorry, that's a bit long, but um, so the the two films are on the exhibition website in case anyone wants to see them on their own screen and in your own, you know, at your own pleasure. Um, yeah, I don't know how I'm doing for time with the, we should open it up, yeah. super. Thank you.
Well, thank you. And so the two films are actually going to be fully viewable on the exhibition website for three days, starting today. So you have the whole weekend to watch the two films. The second film, Chiba Ishi 2023, is on display in the exhibition gallery. But uh, the first one is not in the exhibition, but you can watch it at, on your devices and at home. So uh, thank you all for your wonderful presentations. And I appreciate the chance to hear each of you situate the works in the exhibition in your own artistic practice and trajectory. So I really appreciate this chance. And as a reminder that uh, all these members are welcome to um, submit questions at any time. We'll uh, get to as many as we can, although our time is quite limited, I realize. Uh, whether you are here in person or watching online, you can submit your questions using the Slido link provided on the screen behind me. Use the QR code or post in the chat on uh, Zoom, Zoom webinar. So I will start with a few specific questions addressed to each of you and maybe uh, ask some general questions that are addressed to all of you. So I guess I'll start with, um, you know, it's, I will just start by saying, you know, uh, the exhibition focuses on water and the challenge of representation because water is ubiquitous. It's everywhere, so it is nowhere. This is to quote my colleague Yukio Lipit, who uh, moderated the open, opening event for the exhibition. So in the era of climate change, water is only talked about through its near absence or overwhelming presence as in drought or flood, and always as a subject of crisis. And especially as city, city dwellers, urban dwellers, we rarely question our own relationship with water. This is my constant uh, debate with my son about like, you gotta, you gotta not run your tap all the time. And he has no idea, I feel. But so my curatorial aim is to draw people's attention to uh, different ways of being with water and provide alternative frameworks to talk about water and climate crisis uh, than that of resources, stress, and economy. So I believe each of your work does this work. And so Evelyn, you know I was really drawn to your work, particularly because of your brilliant use of color and this meticulous drawing um, that remind me of the much older, like the so-called miniature paintings uh, by painters of in the Indian subcontinent that you kindly brought into your presentation. And the unraveling that you showed at the end of your presentation, which is in the uh, exhibition, your drawing transformed pieces of discarded marine trash into alluringly beautiful pictorial forms and kind of a moment of contemplation and storytelling emerged between this push and pull in a way that is this, you know, the beauty of your drawing that draws you in and then sort of the ugly reality actually of the, of this disintegrating actually fishing ropes. Uh, with microplastic pieces, which represent in a way the environmental pollution behind the state of climate emergency we're in. So you can see kind of many temporalities seem to be at play in a single drawing like the unraveling, the like rapid cycle of consumer plastic goods, production, use, and disposal, the slow speed of disintegration of the plastic in nature, especially in ocean water. And I had to Google like how long it takes the plastic rope, like the fishing rope to disintegrate. According to one study, fishing ropes will take 600 years to de decompose, but there isn't any data available to tell whether plastic decomposes in ocean at all. That's why we're talking about microplastics everywhere, right? So there is that time, slow speed of disintegration, and then laborious time you, you spent on making the piece and the time ta it takes for us to recognize this uncanny discrepancy. Is there sort of time of multiple temporalities any consideration in your work? Can you, I mean, I know you sort of explain your process, but can you sort of tell us a little bit more about your intention in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Tina, and uh, yes, I Time, thinking about time is such an important part of the work. I think going back and forth between micro and macro scales, not just as a way of looking and seeing, but also thinking through geologic time, thinking about the water before us, the water through our impact now, and the water in the future, and different possibilities. I think that uh, the way I'm making the drawings through jeweler's glasses is about really close attention and careful observation. It's illogical and irrational in, the, in, in contrast to the pace of production um, in our contemporary lives. But that's done with a kind of intention, a kind of care and craft of making um, a care about 
the water that this debris comes from and in contrast to the kind of mass production mm -hmm. and disposability that these objects I'm drawing from are made with. Um, and, and yes, those things disintegrate and disintegrate and disintegrate, becoming smaller, out of sight. I'm really interested in bringing close attention to things that are on the peripheries of our vision or um, kind of bringing visibility to things um, that are beyond, beyond our own mm -hmm. vision. So uh, yes, that's an important part of the work. Oh, thank you. And in a way, you tackle the issue of how to represent water head on with your artistic practice, I feel. Your site-specific installation of paper sculpture that everyone kind of wowed at. And if you haven't seen it, you must see it in person in the gallery. And especially sort of uh, compelling in the context of the exhibition as it literally brought water gushing into art gallery, which normal circumstances, you do not want water in the art gallery. You just don't want water in the art gallery. So I was so glad that you and I had the same idea about this coming off the wall. But uh, it was actually surprising to have an installation piece that to made with what may be considered flimsy material, like you know photographs printed on archival paper, and displayed without any physical barrier. So in a way, I, I recall asking Joe Zane, our wonderful gallery coordinator and ex exhibition designer, when I saw this installed, are you sure Evelyn wants this like okay without a barrier? That what if people step on it? But I, I mean, I love it that its scale predetermines a viewer's relationship with like miniature paintings in the same section in a way that it requires them to be so close. And um, I would love you to sort of tell us more about this sort of thinking around the scale and what you're thinking about, like scale in the space and uh, also like how you represent the specificity and neutrality water at the same time mm. through that piece. So that, I mean, you don't you, because I was like, if, what if somebody steps on this <laughs> was my concern, so. <laughs> well, um, it's funny you mentioned Joe Zane because when I came to the gallery to do a kind of site visit and bring a small model, I was looking around um, and I asked Joe, if a leak came into this building, where do you think it would enter? And he said, I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> but I was kind of imagining, sort of looking at where there could be cracks or creases. Um, but in terms of scale, I wanted to shift back and forth between something that feels how the ocean feel massive, overwhelming, but also bring the intimacy that can come from holding water in your hands. So I wanted to shift back and forth and have those different scales between coming up close and having this individual relationship. And I can look at um, those water bodies and identify, I can look at them and say, oh, that's Cartagena, that's Miami, that's, I could sort of, they're ingrained in my memory. But I wanted that individuality of color, of temperature, of different currents to really be um, seen and visible in each individual part. And yet the core of that project is really about water as a single interconnected body. Um, and in terms of getting close to it, um, I really wanted, like a leak for the water, to feel like it was pouring out into the space, kind of taking over, and, and for people to feel, um, so a special feeling for me is that sense of being at the water's edge, that, that space mm. between land and water, especially that in-between space um, where things are in motion and transition mm -hmm. and in flux. So I wanted to really play with people's own sense of getting close and, and having that close, intimate relationship. Oh, that's wonderful. So that, that segues uh, to what I was about to ask Atul, because uh, I think you also like now like bring the water into your like you know you're actually I mean you're I have a quote from you like I couldn't be just sitting on the standing on the bank looking at the, the river I had to go in and um, so water plays a crucial role in most world religious uh, and spiritual practices. Uh, you know, washing one scene, offering ablution, or sending dec deceased loved ones away, like on the water. So I know you have said at one point you don't make art with any religious conviction or don't intend any religious meaning, but especially in the work that's currently on display, I was not waving but drowning. I found the work's religious and spiritual force pretty strong. And, uh, you know, can you tell us more about how these more, more cosmic, conceptual, spiritual meanings of religious rituals help or play a role in shaping your practice in art making? And if I'm making free association and you just have no intention of this you know, ev evocation, please just shut me down. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, uh, no, there, I mean, there are connections, but I mean, uh, there are no, if I would say, there are no religious markings. 
immersing myself into the river, and I mean, a number of, uh, I mean, one could associate with Hindu rites, you can associate with other rites, where immersion, baptism, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, takes places. So I wouldn't kind of limit it to only one religious reading. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it, there is uh, spirituality in it. There is this thing. It's also about being one with a body of water, mm -hmm. right? And uh, <clears throat> it's also about connecting to what Evelyn also said of the singular, single interconnected body of water. And when I say you always step into the same river mm -hmm. and taking off from Heraclitus, he says you never step into the same river twice because neither it's the same, neither are you the same man, neither is it the same river. But I think both of us look at it in a way that it all, the whole world in itself is one single body of water. So if one takes, looks at uh, memory being within waters, whether it's the ancient myth that we step in, where that the Mahabharata that I quoted from, or look at, <coughs> Uh, boy, you know, scientifically, if you look, look at water having memory, mm. so there is cultural memory when you step into any water, whether it's the currents, whether it's the rivers, etc. Mm. So when you immerse myself, yes, there is a spirituality in it. There is a connection of the body being also 70, 80 percent water and being with the medium, which is majority of your body as well. So there are various connections within that and also what is important is that it's not titled, it's titled from a Steve Smith's poem by the same name, I was not waving but drowning. So all of those things kind of matter to for it to be kind of uh, connected and kind of reach a coherence and transcend local meanings. Mm -hmm. So that was the intent. Right. And uh, incidentally also is also, that somebody asked me at some time ago, I just wanted to bring it in, or was I facing upstream or downstream? Mm -hmm. right. It's interesting that I was facing downstream. So it's, it's one, one of those things that, you know, it's also about the meeting the, meeting the seas, mm -hmm. you know, so that's one of the things. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm like kind of getting aware of my time, so I'm gonna ask like a question to Alia too. In a way, thank you also for sharing the context uh, with, in which to understand your piece in the exhibition. So I'm so glad that you showed us that monumental um, water vessels, including the Luta, the water jug. You know, I really wanted one of these <laughs> monumental water vessels in the exhibition, but our gallery space is so limited, so I couldn't put that in. <laughs> and um, and uh, you can see like why I wanted one in this exhibition about water stories. Um, and you have such diverse approaches and materials that you deal with in your practice, And but also there is constant theme of engaging with the ecological and climate crisis that we face in specific localities. Uh, so what is the process of developing new aesthetic strategies in your practice in thinking about these sort of, you know, much larger themes? So in my, in my work, I'm, I'm not really like bound to um, a medium or a material. I'm rather like following a kind of thought process. And, um, you know, with the films, I think the, the image making is the way that the way that the image is made is really important to the kind of methodology of the of the of the work and um, you know especially in the, in the context of Iraq I feel like I grew up in a I grew up in a in a Kuwait that was very much divided from Iraq and my in fact have family on both sides of the border and I grew up seeing images of uh, my, the the kind of Iraqi side of the border being represented in a sort of uh, in a very vilified way and um, I think with the with the images that I'm making it's um, I'm challenging I guess as a representations of um, kind of the Iraqi communities and I think also the with the Iraq you know it's um, Iraq has often been depicted as a place with or the Arab world in general as a place with sort of no um, it, sort of a barren landscape and to think of uh, the Iraqi marshes and life there and in, in the Abu al-Khazib region as well is, is something I want to bring into the picture. Um, yeah. Great, well, I mean, I think you also, all of you actually kind of addresses, addressed the question I had in mind for all of you to address, which is sort of the relationship between local and global and sort of, or hyper-local and global or personal to universal in your work and really addressing sort of the issues that you bring to bear on in, in relation to climate crisis. I wonder if you can sort of comment on, um, so sort of based on the work that you have already talked about in this hour presentation. Yeah, I, I think often of that relationship between 
local and global and making work from the point at which you're based, from personal experiences, from histories of a particular site and thinking about the way they're interconnected in a broader way, coming closer and closer to the local sometimes helps us see more broadly. Um, I think in some of the projects, for example, the Mouth, um, a Merrimack River project that I shared, in studying local rivers, I was thinking a lot about this shift between something that feels local, our own perception of coastlines or rivers often being about um, a small fragment of a much larger line. We experience them in a very specific way. Um, and when I hear about runoff, um, toxins, um, combined sewage overflows, all these different impacts that affect the water, the rivers, and the communities that rely on them, I think about the way oftentimes it feels very specific, but in two or three days, the, that water, those toxins, those pollutants might leave a river, mm -hmm. but they don't really exit or leave. They become part of the Atlantic Ocean here, mm -hmm. um, for, for example, based here in Boston. Um, and so I, th I think a lot about how what happens in a specific local point becomes part of global currents and global waterways. So maybe that's one example through a specific project, yeah. but um, I try to shift back and forth, both through scale, but also um, in the thinking about the work. Patu? Uh, yeah, uh, let's see, the, I, I mean, most of my work is extremely local, when you say hyper-local, and uh, that's how what makes you take, because it's about local knowledge, which can transcend boundaries and transcend things. The world global in itself, has a certain homogeneity in it, mm -hmm. which is kind of, it takes you away from the multiple heterogeneity mm -hmm. of uh, readings and multiplicities, which will kind of actually, if we work with them, will will uh, lead us to more readings of what the crisis that we are facing and also to deal with them. So I think local materials, whether it's wood or sand, or I use a lot of river sand, I use local wood, I use <coughs> local craftsmen as collaborators, all, all those things, and local knowledge, all that comes in. So if one doesn't build on that, then how is one an artist of the mm -hmm. place that one is from? Even though, I mean, they can transcend in themselves into multiple other readings uh, that, uh, you know, like the work, I was not aware with my drowning has, or even the work, deliverance of a boat hanging in midair. But then the reading of these things are extremely local as well as that. So all of these reading kind of add to the work transcending itself and actually becoming much larger than it originally was, mm -hmm. because other people add up to the reading and right. they wanted to know. So I think it's extremely important for me to kind of, uh, you know, use local materials and local knowledge, and local stories as well, in making of these works. Thank you. Alia? I sort of think like Atu was mentioning <clears throat> earlier that the entire, the entire world is like one body of water. And I think that when we share our water stories, people realize that, you know, like with the kind of damming infrastructures, these water stories have a similarity, right? That these yeah. issues are, are happening in rivers I'm more familiar with and rivers you know. And, and, and that's how the work kind of relates, you know? Right, right. Well, thank you, and I, I mean, I realize there are many audience questions and we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna just uh, kind of select a few. I think there is, uh, there are many that actually are asking about, uh, you know, how your art can help raise awareness about environment issues or, you know, climate crisis. What do you want people to kind of uh, get away from, get from your work in terms of thinking about environmental issues? And I, I think I, I think everyone kind of dressed it in a way, so I'll skip that. <laughs> but, uh, and another question is, let's see. Well, uh, there were several references to significance of water in religious stories. Do any of you directly engage religious ideas in your work? Because we're actually going to also talk about religion in the next panel, so that might be a, pan a panel to talk about this more. Uh, but if you, any of you, want to kind of jump in, think about religion here. I mean, I, rather than religion, I rather think of mythology. Like I would just want to change the term in some, because it's the, it's the myths that surround things that kind of make it stick, rather than labeling it to a religion, because religion becomes structured. My myths are continuously being engaged with and kind of grow with what people bring to the myths. So I just want to kind of, 
which is the mythologies of rivers, my, small mythologies around rivers, around boats, around things, around mm -hmm. sites, of rivers, of water bodies, that kind of bring in. So I try to kind of move to mythology right. rather mm -hmm. than kind of religion itself. Yeah, I guess when you say religion, it often kind of brings out the idea of doctrine, dogmatic, uh, sort of following of faith, but uh, rather thinking about mythology, kind of readjusting our framing. I think that's uh, very helpful. And there is a, let's see, question for everyone, that juxtaposition of movement and stillness is striking in many of your works. Does this arise from the nature of water as a subject? which is an interesting observation actually, that mm -hmm. movement and stillness. Mm -hmm. Do you think about this in kind of your work? I think it's a beautiful observation. I didn't, I'm, I mean, I often look at water making work in making the work, but uh, I think that's a beautiful description of how, how the work is looked at, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's also in a way a kind of challenge of represent, you asked earlier about representing Patient, water, yeah. one of the, core sort of elements of water is this living, moving body um, that is never fully still. Even when it seems still, there is invisible kind of life mm -hmm. and movement mm -hmm. having, happening, even maybe at a bacterial level. Right. So, um, so that kind of holding that tension or mm -hmm. the simultaneity of both stillness and movement, I think is one of the great challenges of working with and representing water. Okay, well, I'll have a last question asked here. So. There is a kind of question about how Atul, Alia, both of you actually talk about partnership with collaborators and uh, boat makers, vessel fabricators, and what have you. So how do their stories and expertise affect your work? Okay. Uh, yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's extremely important that uh, their practices is a huge amount of knowledge, like, in, like the work that I uh, executed, uh, <coughs> deliverance and uh, drift, the boat that was made on the Yamuna. In, in sense of uh, my knowledge in itself of wood and wood being treated as a, a receptacle of water, uh, which is kind of um, which water has left because wood is not meant to be consumed, is actually how the tree would kind of receive water from where it is, right? So, of, of the, so, and the and what does natural material mean? What does craft mean? And all these things. So, it's extremely important to work with them and their relationships with the water. Because in that particular mm. work, uh, the museum uh, said that, okay, you can do, you can work on your idiotic whim to make a boat. Nobody makes a boat on the, the biggest drain of Asia, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, uh, then they said, okay, we take it to the museum. And the boat maker said, no, you cannot go to the museum without touching the river. Ah. So we, mm. we, we had to take it to the river. And it was important for that said that it, it's important for their craft and for the, um. the for the life of their craft and for for the gods to kind of uh, forgive them for whatever mistake they've done, whether it's the river goddess or the whirlpool, whirlpool goddess and the local god uh, <coughs> Vishwakarma, who's the god for labor, all come into play. Mm. So all of these various knowledges kind of uh, add to what how, what it means to. Uh, work as a, as a craft person in India today. I mean, so, you know, so. Yeah, me. thank you. Alia, do you want to comment? Yeah, I think that in the process, there's many things that are learned and it's these collaborations are, um, it's, it's a, yeah, it, you know, with the films I work in, the films sort of occur in an emergent way and it's like I'm being partly directed by um, some of the Marsh residents I work with and being told, why don't you film this? And uh, with the fabricators, it's been really interesting to, you know, Kuwait, Kuwait is a sort of a, a segregated, gender segregated society. And it's very uncommon to see a woman in a workshop in the desert with fiberglass mold makers working to, together. And so that's been really nice to, to be able to work in pro close proximity and, and, um, and be producing together, yeah. Great, great. I think we are like way actually over time so on this panel, but uh, so let's thank our panelists. Oh.